Yes. I'm Madam Nirima from from Jacob. My question is led by what I have said. In my opinion, the Supreme Court is more than a good religion. Where the effective position is <coughs> that practically the body sources of all drinking and sweet water are bestowed upon to the northern uh, American countries, American national countries. And whereas in the Middle East countries they are divided off from this national source. On the contrary, by one thing at the same time, that spiritual water is bestowed upon the Middle East countries, that is, on those countries, and these people are dead countries. It is not uh, a contradiction or something which I do not understand. What is your other source in life on this? I, I don't see any contradiction whatsoever. Mr. Practically 60% of the drinking and sweet water sources and other natural sources are bestowed upon by the Almighty to these northern countries, northern so countries. Is. Oh, who told you this? Uh, sir, it is uh, written in the uh, guidebook of U.S. See, you are talking of a very different phenomenon altogether. You are talking of reservoirs of water. But when God speaks, He says, He sends water from the heaven. And far more water is poured down the rain, the mountain, mountain rain, in India, in, in uh, that uh, tropical regions, then uh, it is ever poured down on Canada. So just knowing that there are larger reservoirs of sweet water does not contradict that statement at all. Moreover, God is speaking of phenomenon. He is not referring to any particular region. The a universal region phenomenon is mentioned. Those countries are uh, practically uh, this uh, African countries and middle countries, there is no water. But we are, uh, it is a uh, huge 60% of the source, uh, source no, of no, water. Where, where, where does God mention that I sent water to Africa or to India or to Arabia? Does it mention? And this is what is speaking of a universal phenomenon. That's right. Because Allah says that we drive away the water to the, uh, to the earth, to the land yes. which requires it, which needs it. Those people need the water. Where the water is here? Just for God's sake, try to understand. Yes, Please. Sir. If there were no water, the land here would be as in Jerusalem. But when because water, God sent water here, so this is no longer the as in Jerusalem. Where did God say that I am speaking of the land not in the north but also in the south, only in the south or in the middle? Is this God is, is describing a natural phenomenon. So wherever that water reached, the dead earth came to life. This is the what is what is God what God is describing. So why do you misinterpret it? The factual position it appears to be that uh, spiritual water is bestowed upon those in those countries. Who told you that? Yes, sir. It, it appears it not like history says. Why do you contradict? History, excuse sir, me. History, why do you contradict the Holy Quran? No. The Holy Quran says we sent spiritual water to all the world, to all the people of the earth, in all ages. Has that not been claimed by the Holy Quran? See. So why are you contradicting that? So why do you say it was sent only there? I have already explained, I have answered this question, that why so much emphasis is being observed from our vantage point to be uh, concentrated on Middle East. I have explained already that prophets came all over the world only because their uh, lines were not to give birth to the final prophet. So they gradually died out and their history was not preserved. If the Holy Quran were to preserve the history of all the religions of the world, this book would be larger than this whole hall. So God has mentioned in principle that we have been sending prophethood all over the world, but God says, addressing the Holy Prophet, that we tell you only a few names out of those. We do not mention others, but we have never deprived any section of humanity 
at any time in the world of this spiritual guidance which you refer to as spiritual water. Moreover, if by the same argument as you are trying to extend, how can you say that these areas are without their spiritual water because Christianity is a water from, from heaven? <coughs> and this was Arjan Jorozan before Christianity reached here. So God is very right both in, in case of uh, uh, literal translation and metaphorical translation that the, what descends from heaven is driven to the areas if the water did not reach those areas, then they would be as in Jerusalem. Without that, they would be as in Jerusalem. Moreover, your knowledge of geography is only pertaining to this time. And you are trying to explain the entire universal phenomenon spread over millions of years. It is not so. If you had read geography better, you would have discovered that the areas of greenery and the areas of preservation of water have been changing. Tilkal ayyaman udaviluha bainan nas is another statement. Some areas which are desert today were full of foliage and full of greenery. If that were not so, oil will not be discovered in the, under those deserts. What is the oil made of? Oil is made of uh, wood and organic material which has long been buried. So, God is speaking in a time frame which is beyond your conception. But if you increase your knowledge, then you will understand that no area of earth has been deprived of this phenomenon, of lush green phenomenon, from water which was poured heavily in those areas, but the climates changed. And they changed so slowly that one generation of human beings fails to uh, understand that phenomenon. In England we have seen climate changing slowly from wet to dry climate. The result is that even if one season is dry, uh, suddenly the earth turns into earth and Jerusalem. That shows that before that it was like this. So if the if God such light shifts from one area to the other and shifts its blessing to that area, the same thing will happen there. So who has told you that Arabia was always like this? It was not. History is not. Pardon? History has no history. No, no, you, you don't know the known history. I am telling you the known history. If you read geography, if you read uh, uh, petrology, etc., you will find and you will be amazed to find that Arabia once was, a, was an area of lush virtue. Intense growth had taken place here of greenery of all sorts until the change was brought about. Change in climate and the uh, wet areas started receding back like the phenomenon of a bald head. Sometimes the head is full of hair and sometimes the hairline begins to recede, leaving a bald patch. This is exactly the phenomenon of appearance of deserts. But deserts are not always at the same place and at the same size. It means that these, these countries can also be converted into deserts. Of course. Into of, desert, desert. Of, the, these countries will be converted into deserts. Not only can be, but the Holy Quran says they will be converted into deserts. Because the Holy Quran in speaking in uh, the Allah speaking in Surah Kaf informs us Inna jalna ma alal arda zinat allaha le nabluwahum ayyuhum asanu asanu amala wa inna la jailuna ma alaha sayyidan yurada It is speaking of the Christian land of its verdure, of its growth, of its lush green and then it says it's so beautiful to look at but we are going to change this whole, uh, uh, you know, this outlook into that of a desert. So God is speaking in a much larger time frame and you are speaking only a short time frame and only from a very limited knowledge of 
some geography. You better enlarge, if you are interested, you better enlarge your knowledge of geography, how things, climates change, they recede, they come forward, and you'll be surprised to find that this verse is applicable in turn by turn to almost all the regions of the earth. Thank you. Sir, can you uh, uh, guide me to any book which... Uh, no, no, you, the light you better of, find Arabia, out... That Arabia was once upon a time it was a fertile land. I say you better turn to the specialist, the geographer, geographers, etc. and find out why there is oil underneath Arabian countries, which are desert. What is all made of? Thank you. Thank you. Pardon? Uh -huh. there, there are some questions from ladies, sir? Or in writing, anyway. Would you go and uh, please start? give some brief account of the persecution and atrocities against some of these in Pakistan. I don't think it is uh, the right forum for this. Second question, please. Then uh, his sister writes that uh, if Ahmadis uh, are persecuted and they retaliate, for example, if the students uh, retaliate in the classes when the, uh, some professors abuse, would it be all right? The question is whether Islam permits you to retaliate physically if you are abused verbally. The answer is no. The Holy Quran says, if you are verbally abused, you have a right to abuse verbally. If you are physically abused, you have a right to retaliate in the same way. So he is talking of a situation, or she is talking of a situation where Ahmadis are verbally abused. So they can defend themselves, get up, and when they are physically assaulted, then they have a right to hit back. But I have advised them not to do it because it will be against their group interest. Please. And then the sister writes that uh, do we, after the Muslim ladies, need some sign of recognition? For example, uh, sometimes ladies are at once recognized by their headdress, which is a symbol of recognition. The so, ladies from India, Sri Lanka are known due to India on their foreheads. Right. What should be the sign of distinction for the Amdi women? What should be the sign? sign of recognition? The sign of recognition is taqwa. That's <laughs> the best sign. They should bear themselves in the style of a God-fearing lady and they should be known by that style. Sister writes that uh, in Abu Dawood, uh, there is a hadith by Abu Hazrat Abu Raya Rizal Taranko, he reported the Holy Prophet as saying, the best of the men's robe is the first, and the, and the worst of them is the last. But the best of the women's robes is the last. Just a minute, please read again, slowly. The best of the men's rows in the, is the first and the worst of them is the last. I don't know this which Hadith she's talking about. I have never heard of this. So, who the questioner must uh, refer to the text and give reference because I never come, came across it. This doesn't mean any sense to me at all. Unless I find out where it is said, in what context it is said. 
I will not be able to answer this question. The sister writes that uh, if uh, someone uh, suffers because of uh, some somebody's injustice, what? if somebody suffers at the hand of some injustice committed against him, yes, right, and he is or she is innocent, right. Some people say that uh, this is a. Uh, it's a trial. Yes. It's a law. And the other says, no, no, this is a punishment. What is the difference between trials and punishments? The suffering... Well, the punishment destroys and the trials uh, bring forth the best in those who are tried. The simple example I can point out is that of uh, um, what we call Godi in Punjabi and what do you call it in English? The word I knew but is slipping me. Huh? Godi, Malai, huh? weeding, weeding, out, weeding. Weeding out of weeds. When, if you have witnessed uh, a field where weeds are uh, rooted out, Immediately after the process has been done, the looks are so bad, some plants are also injured and uh, if you do it in munji or, 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 or wheat, you see the whole look is so desolate. But after a while, it flourishes forth. In, in Punjabi we say buta marna. You know, then it, it, the, every uh, uh, Sapling becomes stronger and multiplies by itself. So that is ittala. But if some pigs destroy that field, they also ploy it sort of with their, with their, with their special teeth. Nothing is left of that. The whole crop is destroyed. And also when destruction falls in the form of bolts from heaven, Electrical charges strike such people, such areas. They leave it totally desolate, nothing is left. So these are punishments of some sort or tragedies. In the case of first, it is a tragedy. In the case of second, it could be punishment. But it is not iptala, it's not trial. In trials, the communities which pass through the trials, they always flourish and increase and become stronger. That has been happening to Ahmadiyyad in the last 100 years that happened to Islam in its early stages as well that happened to Christi Christianity for 300 years uh, of, of its early history they were most beastly treated even they were fed to the beasts but they stood firm and behaved uh, and, and uh, showed patience, exercised patience in the cause of Allah and they were the first three hundreds of years of Christianity whose uh, labor, whose fruit the Christianity is still eating because it was their sacrifices which have been rewarded. So, ittala is always rewarded. It does not come to destroy you. Punishment destroys you or leaves you very weak and uh, much smaller and lesser in importance. So that is the major difference between Ittala and Azab. Otherwise, all the prophets would be considered to be under Azab. There is none among them who had an easy time in life. So just to go through the hard time doesn't mean if somebody is under wrath of Allah. The result would tell us. What can Ahmadi's children do for the demand? What Ahmadis can? What Ahmadi's children can do for the demand? Ahmadi's children can, what, what can they can do for the Jamaat? First of all, this is a very obscure question. I can't understand why it is or what is meant by that. If it is asked by a child, I would tell him 
to behave like a good child, seeking his guidance from the holy people before, when they were children, how they behave. For instance, he can one each, and every child can imagine how Ahazu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spent his childhood. And then when the perfect model of Ahazu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once again appeared in the present times, how Hazrat Basim Adhra Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam behaved, um, conducted himself during his childhood. So it's a long story. Behave in that way, that is the best an every child can do, and that will be the service to Ahmadiyya. Another question is that uh, in the Holy Quran it says, Salam ala Ilyasin. What is the meaning of Ilyas? And secondly, uh, every prophet who comes as uh, Irhas, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, is he called Ilyas? You see, this is a question of commentary on some passages of the Holy Quran which are left open for discussion or for further investigation. According to some, there was not one prophet by the name of Ilyas, but there were three prophets by the name of Ilyas. So when the Holy Quran refers to Ilyas, Ilyasin, it means there were three prophets by the name of Ilyas. So the plural of Ilyas is mentioned here in the word Ilyasin. And some say that they, this refers to a non-Arab prophet. And uh, some say that this refers to an Indian prophet or some other prophet. So many commentators have opined on this question. And some say out of respect for Ilyas, there was, there might have been the Hebrew practice, now it was Hebrew practice, even to mention a proper name in plural, out of respect. So maybe Ilyas also was treated like that by his people who loved him and referred to him in plural, while normally this was not a practice. In case of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah we have seen this happen. Muhammadin, Muhammadin is the plural of Muhammad. So it is uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, which we, we, uh, from which we infer that out of respect, like the Hebrew practice was, he was his name was mentioned in plural. So it could have been the case with Hazrat Elias. So we don't know exactly because. That part of history is obscure, but I believe whenever the Holy Quran refers to any phase of history, however obscure it may be at that stage or remain obscure for many hundreds of years, a time comes when the lid is lifted and the mystery is resolved. Like in the case of the corpse of Pharaoh, when the Holy Quran mentioned that the corpse of Pharaoh would be preserved for the future generations to draw a lesson from this. There was no sign of any corpse of Pharaoh in existence. In fact, the entire uh, area of pyramid had been had gone under thick layers of sand, and at the time of Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this story had also been has been entirely buried under thick sand. Yet the Holy Quran says. That God promised him, I would keep your corpse as a sign for the future so that people take, draw the lesson from what happened to you. And in the present century, by the turn of this century, what you, you know already that uh, the corpse of that same Pharaoh, uh, Ramses II, was discovered from uh, uh, some of the pyramids areas around. So that is what I mean. Ilyasin also, I believe, and many other such words which have not yet been fully explained, would be further explained at the appropriate time. Some discoveries will be made in future and the people of that time will learn when the time comes for them to learn what the real meaning of Ilyasin was. 
the question is that uh, are Sunni Muslims allowed to participate in Halloween? Halloween? This is a celebration when people wear costumes and they paint their faces and children go You see, to have some private fun in the family is not uh, something which uh, you should take so seriously. But uh, as national celebrations, these things are not promoted in Islam. Any huge waste of any sort of national wealth is discouraged. But uh, I remember when you were your children in Kadiyan, we used to play Hes Badalna, disguise. And uh, in Kadiyan it was a popular sport. Many a time we get, got together and people changed their dresses and there used to be uh, present uh, uh, these prizes for those who disguised themselves, themselves so completely that nobody could pinpoint who he was or she was. So the ladies had their disguise uh, bouts and so also men had their, those tournaments. So that was done under the very eyes of the, prom the companions of the Prophet Messiah etc. If there were anything basically wrong with that, they would have, should have stopped us. So, these small funds, if they are not carried too far, should be considered all right. But don't uh, acquire the habit of asking too many questions. That will create difficulties for you. The Holy Quran has discouraged this. The Holy Quran says, La tasalu an ashyayim. In Tubdalakum Tasokum. Anasha. La Tasalu Anasha. In Tubdalakum Tasokum. Don't ask about things too much, over much. Because it is possible that when the answer is given, it will create difficulties for you. So, in small areas of human uh, failings here and there and relaxations, you should not become over-critical and over-austere. For the life on earth will become a very difficult life. Already there, there are so many do's and do-nots in Islam. Why to add a few more? <laughs> Two more? Not a few more. Two more questions you mean? Mr. Sister Rai said, to my knowledge, there are two types of uh, jihad. Greater jihad, which is a personal inner struggle against evil. Right. Whereas lesser jihad, the fighting of Muslims with non-Muslims for the protection of Islam, is the inner struggle against evil, is the prerequisite of the fighting for non I No, no, I didn't say that. But I said, because you don't know the gender of the questioner, just use the word questioner instead. Right? Okay. Yes. Yes. The person must be practicing the Hadiyasra. I think. I, I never came across any incident. In the, during the lifetime of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or uh, the time which followed later during the lifetime of the Khalis. If anybody when he wanted to participate in jihad, he was put through the middle of questioning. Have you done your jihad ever or not? If not, then go and get aside. So never once that. This is just extending things too far. Only 
this head and show you the same. You see, this is a cryptic religious uh, Jewish practice of uh, the extremists in Judaism and uh, they believe that the word God is not a word which should apply to God at all but when they have to live and co-live with others they have invented things to hide this uh, very strict attitude and they appear to be liberal in some way. So secretly they apply these tricks. That when we say God, it's not the, the whole word, we miss something and we change it slightly, it becomes meaningless because their God, they say, is meaningless anyway. So they only refer to God as Jehovah. And that is the official title for God. No other title is acceptable to them, to these extremists. So they have been playing such tricks and uh, they are small things, meaningless. Yes. That's all from the written questions. Now how many hands are raised and how many time is left? How much time I mean, sorry. Raise, raise your hands, let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16. So, if we give two minutes to each question, we'll finish by half past ten. But even if the, all the questions are not exhausted, we'll finish by half past ten. Okay? So, now you can, all of you go there and make a queue. Those will be left over, they will be attended tomorrow, they should register their right to be first tomorrow. And register it with somebody you find. Stand in the queue and then sit. And somebody should count that they should not be more than 16. <laughs> I tell you, once a believer in Nostradam, what was his name, uh, wanted me to give my opinion. I said, come and this is the book. You first tell me which is the prophecy about the future. Don't talk of the past prophecies which were fulfilled. Because there, they have a very strong, a strong, very strange involved logic. This doesn't mean any sense at all. So, none of the prophecies which were pointed out came to be true. But uh, you see, I happen to have come across one prophecy. You know, as he wrote in... Uh, no, no, you, you better give me a point out from the book. Yes, I will a chapter that this is a prophecy about the future. Yes, it is. Then come to me when it is fulfilled. Well, right now I will point this out, but yes. it, it is regarding Ahmadiyya. Yes. The, uh, the spreading of Ahmadiyya. Yes. And inshallah I will uh, write to you about this. I, I show you when I investigate, it will be found as nothing. Okay, but, yes, but for, as long as it is not proved, your question is not valid. Okay. When you prove to me, then I will be answerable to you. Not before that. But, but the second part of this also is, what is about, that? about satanic revelation. And in terms of uh, if, right. if there is revelation, and what chance 
is it a satanic revelation being actual events of the future? The Satan doesn't know the future. He, God, the Holy Quran says he makes false promises. You understand? Yes. So, the man who makes false promises doesn't read the future. He misleads you by giving you the impression this will happen in the future. It doesn't happen. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Second, no, no, the, this cube. Second man on the cube. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad. You better keep from the top. Second man has come. Come to the best out of 16. So, according to our Ahmadis believe that uh, you, Lord, is uh, the highest authority in the matters of uh, Sharia and others and in Islamic Jews of this age. So, I was wondering if perhaps I could ask a question. You were answering that particular question in the very first day when uh, perhaps Mr. Jim asked you a question that uh, this is a Canadian society and uh, no, you answered that this is a, a growing society of different religions. Now you being a Jewish, if, if you are asked to address this matter in, in the Canadian constitution regarding the Muslim Sharia, how would you answer to that? I have answered this question regard, regarding the application of Sharia not only with regards to Canadian uh, situation, but regarding situation everywhere in the world. I, I, if you were there when Mr. Jim asked this question, I, I, I reminded him, I, whether it was Jim or somebody else, I don't remember exactly, but I answered this question during my visit here and reminded the questioner that Islam is understood from 50 to 6, 72 vantage points and Sharia is understood differently by different sects and each claims to be representing the word of God. So, what would be the position of a Sharia which is implemented by Shias in one area, they say this is the word of God and the word of God which will be practiced in Saudi Arabia will be so different in so many things. And practiced in Iran, it would be a, in, in, in Indonesia, it would be different. So, how can there be confusion in Sharia? And if you do not know exactly what the word of God is, how can you implement it? You see? So Sharia can only be implemented truly and honestly at the time of the prophets and their companions and their caliphs, not otherwise. And then the Sharia is one human entity, insplitable, and indivisible. Nobody can question Sharia. But when it has become many entities, it becomes impossible. Secondly, the people on whom the Sharia law is to be imposed also will determine whether it is possible or not. Uh, if you want, are interested in this subject, you better listen to the cassette which was prepared in Suriname where in a multi-religious uh, mood, which was attended by Catholics, Bishop of Catholics and ulama and all sorts, Hindu scholars, I was uh, required to address them on the subject. I spoke about an لكن كما ذكرت في السنه الماضيه ايضا وسوف اكرر هذا القول Abdul Salam from Ghana. Abdul Salam. I know. 
Don't be confused. I just said one friend will let you. My question is, um, did Elijah ascend to heaven as he had been alive? The way he ascended, exactly the same way he descended, or in the similar phenomenon. People come to be born and they also die. These are two ends. So when he disappeared, one end was mentioned. When he was to reappear, the other end was mentioned. You understand? And when he reappeared, Jesus Christ told us that he reappeared having been born, not having bodily descended. So the other end is also explained. When he ascended, he must have gone to the grave and disappeared like life comes to an end here. You see, the Bible does not only mention he ascended, it also mentions he would descend once again before the coming of Christ. So when you understand the manner of descent, then should, you should also understand the manner of ascent. That is my argument. You understand? And the Elijah never descended bodily from heaven. He was born in the form of John the Baptist. That is the verdict of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. This, this verdict is binding on every Muslim and every Christian. Then why didn't the Bible state that um, he died or something like that? Why? Why didn't the Bible say that he died? But it's saying that he was carried up into heaven on a child. Of why didn't it say yeah. he died? Because when somebody is, is mentioned that he would come again, these parables are used, these phrases are used. Because somebody in his character was to be born. So some people say he went to heaven and uh, some described, misunderstood, some people who heard this story, my uh, assessment is that they must have misunderstood the, the word of God. When he, he might have said, this man would return to me and will once again come. To deliver a purpose, to serve a purpose. This must have been misunderstood, and the scribes of the Bible then wrote this message in their own way. Like when you read in the Holy Quran that I did not, but uh, did, Jesus did not die upon cross. Most certainly not. But I lifted him to myself. The same message is understood by Ahmadis as a message of death to him. But by other Muslim scholars as a message of body in the center of Jesus. So this fact has already been, trans, uh, has been demonstrated in our own lifetime. This happens. The verse is there. The two different opinions are here. So the, the majority of the Muslims believe in that literal understanding of the word. So when they write about the message in the Quran, they write exactly the same way as some people wrote about Elijah earlier. So from that I understand, a similar phenomenon must have taken place there. Moreover, you should remember that the New Old Testament did not come to be, did not get committed to writing until about 200 years before Jesus Christ. And what? Old Testament. Old Testament. Before Jesus, I'm saying. So, this Elijah story is earlier. And uh, much of the Bible was just verbal reporting. So, why do you find contradictions? It's not that the, the word of God has contradiction. It is not because it is not the word of God at all. Our understanding is, it was the word of God all right, but because it was verbally carried and transferred from person to person, so some people misunderstood the meaning and added their own explanation to what they had heard. The Quran is 
reserved verbatim. So it could, Muslims could not do that to the Quran. But those things which are not preserved verbatim, they are always open to this danger. So something like that happened to the Bible. For instance, I mentioned that yesterday the word day. The Holy Quran speaks of six days of creation and the seventh day of rest. The Bible also speaks of that. The Holy Quran clarifies that the by day we do not mean the same day as you reckon. Our day could be much bigger, like 5,000 years day or 50,000 years day. So there is no confusion among the Muslims. But in the Old Testament, this was not mentioned so specifically. The result was that some scribes wanted to explain what day was. And they added, the sun, when the sun rose, one day began. And the one, when the sun set, the other day, uh, the, 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 the day came to an end. And the night started. With a minha. So they distorted uh, the message of the Bible, he which was speaking of a much longer period. Him. And it also became so illogical because the universe, the land, earth was not yet created and the days were born. How could they be born? So the absurdity is not to be attributed to God. It is to be attributed to those people who misunderstood the message of God and recorded it wrongly. So I believe a very similar thing must have happened to the story of Elijah. Thank you. Understand? You understand or not? Okay, thank you. My name is Alessa Khan. Your name is what? Alessa Khan. Alessa Khan, right? From Lahore and then Sandalur. Right. My question is about as the Allah. Amaluna Behasabiawa. In the Surah Hadith, the Riyadh. It means there are many words, all the words were right. So I remember in the future we will contact that words. What the communication mean, the human being with the Jew, does it want guide to this energy? The Holy Quran speaks of not only a possibility, but of a time when God would see to it that the life here on earth meets the life elsewhere in the heavens, in the space. And Having said that, the Holy Quran says, the, the wording is, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَثَّ فِيهِمَا مِنْ دَابَّةِ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ جَمْعِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءُ قَدِيرٌ That from among the signs of Allah is the creation of the heaven and earth. And of the signs of Allah is the fact that He has created life both on earth and also in the heavens, that is the surrounding uh, space. Whatever you translate heaven with, sama with, it, is, it means the jav, the outer space. And then it says, wa huwa ala jammehim, iza yashaw When God so wishes, He is capable of uniting them. Now, this word jama can be understood literally as well as metaphorically. Literally jama would mean that either the life from space would be able to visit this earth and here they will be gathered together. Or people from this earth will become advanced enough to reach such planets or some stars or something in space where there will be other types of life. And the second meaning is jam, of jama is metaphorical, which means they will be able to communicate with each other. They will become jama, they will be united in communication, in thought, in understanding. And that is what you are asking now. Is it right? Yeah. Yes. So in that, it, the Holy Quran has not mentioned which language will be used, what will be the mode of communication. But some parapsychologists have suggested that in parapsychology the thought travels without words. 
and the meaning is conveyed to the other person without words. And they have proved it that even dogs receive messages from mind. So if dogs can receive messages from mind, the person may be an English-speaking person, a Chinese, a Japanese, or an Urdu-speaking person. What he thinks is conveyed to the dog's mind. So the power of mind is different and the language of mind is different. So these parapsychologists have just suggested exactly what you are asking, that perhaps when we come to contact with the people of space, by that time we would have developed a science of parapsychology to a degree that we will be able to communicate just by thought, not by words, not by the spoken words or sound, and then they will understand. And some say that uh, it is not necessary. Whenever you communicate with other things, you, you come across other cultures whose language was not known to you, like uh, the language of the dead language of the Egyptians, for instance. God has given man power to learn by applying his intelligence. So they suggest maybe a time would come then when we meet, we begin to indicate things to each other through sign language and gradually learn each other's language and uh, learn to communicate in both languages. So all these possibilities are open. Uh, may I ask another question, sir? All right, yes. It's about Purda. As we are in Canada, so sometimes our ladies, they feel problem. I have already spoken enough on Parda repeatedly. The cassettes are available, so you can have access to them, please. Thank, Thank you. Aswakum. My name is Nazim Mirza. I'm from Brampton, Jamaat. Well, we just wanted to ask what your opinion is if the Palestinians will ever gain their own homeland eventually. We see in our lifetime. You see, haven't you heard my, my sermon, uh, sermon on Gulf? On the, on the question of Palestine? Right. Just a little bit. So that we learn more from that. I love Thank you. 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 <laughs> okay, uh, a lot of scientists today are working towards the theory of Big Bang. Yes. And they have calculated to say one billion of the second after what happens after Big Bang. Uh, I want to know what Quran reveals to us uh, about the creation. The Quran reveals to us about the creation. That's one statement. That the earth and the heavens were just one mass, closely packed together. Ratkan means a ball made of, for instance, of cloth, which is sewn so tightly that nothing of the inner material can escape. That is the Arabic word for Ratkan. So the Holy Quran says that the entire universe was in a state of ratka, of fataqna huma, and we ripped it open. And then what happened? The Holy Quran says that we created the heavens and earth, inna la museun, and we constantly go on expanding them. So the concept of expanding universe is born out of that verse. So what should have happened by putting two and two together, one can imagine that after the energies which were in a state of wrath were released by the Holy Quran, the universe immediately began to expand and continues to expand. This is again the verdict of the scientists, this is what happened. Then the Holy Quran says, that Yama Natri Sama Katayis Tayis Sejil Lil Kutab, a time would come when we would wrap up the entire universe like the rolling of a scroll. And that I have explained yesterday what the phenomena means. 
Then it says, Kama Badana Awal Al Khalke Noido. Like we gave uh, the first, uh, I've created uh, universe for the first time. We will repeat this phenomenon again and again and again. So it will come to a close and then it will restart. So this is the whole story. And whatever I have read are the scientific discoveries. All the theories live within the four walls of what the Holy Quran has stated. Thank you. Jazakumullah. Fatahul Wahid, yes. Wahid Sam. We're all praying, hoping you can visit Kanyana in December. Inshallah. And because of this, I've been watching the situation in India as closely as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this concern. The situation seems to be deteriorating very fast. Yes. And there doesn't seem to be a ray of hope of any stability. So such a visit to such a visit to India. Yes. yes. Uh, so the situation in Punjab is very bad. I know. I know. So, so if, if, the, if the situation would not permit, I will not go. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Everything is in the hands of God. If God does not wish me to go, He will not let the situation improve. And uh, he, will, he can always create many hurdles in the way. So that uh, the proposed visit does not come off. So we are perfectly submitted to the will of Allah. I don't mind either way. Whatever He pleases should be our prayer and that is our prayer. So, so we should pray that the situation improves? Uh, but in your case, there is an additional advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, don't you? Yes. Yes, thank you. We'll also, we should also pray that they, they improve that road from Batala to Kaniya. Yes. <laughs> All right, next please. Mike. Uh, I was told by a member of our Jamaat during the third and fourth class of prayers that we don't have to say a surah at the show of Bhagavad I was just wondering if this is correct. <laughs> I have Will you repeat your question, please? I was told by a member of our Jamaat that for the third and fourth of Pilots of Prayers, that we don't have to say a surah at the al Fatiha. You don't have to say a sir? A surah. A second surah. <laughs> In the third and fourth sakha. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. It is wrong. Whoever has told you has misled you. And you bring him to work for that. Okay. Yes. So a fatya is essential for every rakha. How was it told that after Surah al Fatiha, a separate surah? Uh-huh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. But when you said first, no, I misunderstood you. I'm sorry for that. If he told you that after Surah, Surah Fatiha, in the third and fourth rakat, we do not read, uh, recite the Holy Quran, this is correct. Because it is reported that Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite Surah uh, Fatiha and some verses from the Holy Quran in the first two rakat. And in the second two, he made the rakat shorter and only um, recited Surah Fatiha. Yes. So it is because of that sunnah that we do the same thing. Yes. Thank you. Next, please. I, f I forgot to keep count. Are you keeping count? Yes, yes. Ninth question, one minute left. So be very quick about it. Please, be quick. Well, Sam. My name is Now skip the name now. Please come to the question. My question is, why aren't men allowed to wear a robe in some clothes? Why the Something should be left for ladies, you know. <laughs> because 
the, the message, message to man is you should live a tough life. You should not consider, permit yourself to be, become a nincompoop or a ninny. So there should be a difference between a masculine behavior and a feminine behavior. Women are created that way, that they like decoration and they like uh, adornment and so on. So God has said, all right, enjoy yourself. And men are prevented from wearing gold. And in those societies where this does not happen, men appropriate most of the gold for themselves. If you go to Ghana, you will be surprised to find that in Ashanti region, men wear much more gold than women are ever seen with. So you see, because they were tough, they were powerful, God knew they would appropriate gold for themselves and leave the poor women alone without it. So it's a very good advice to us, I believe. Okay? You see, it's a toughness in you which is, which is emphasized. Masculine, masculine character. Thank you. The, the, the ninth, eighth or ninth question? Tenth, please. And if you, what? Okay. Tenth, please. All right, wait a few minutes or more, please. Uh, as a uh, as you know, uh, humble servant, Mahmoud Majid. My question is that uh, since now we have extended challenge to the Christianity right from 1978 and that they have not come forward. At what stage we are at this time that they have accepted it? We, uh, I, I tried to pick up the thread later on and uh, there was no response. Once they said that uh, the gentleman who, who, who was ready to come into debate is out on tour. When he returns, you will hear from us. And then we repeatedly reminded them and no answer came. So things bitter out of itself. Thank you. Yes? Zul, uh, we have been uh, commanded to straighten the lines before offering the hungry gateway you know, prayers. But Shaking the line? And again, we are asked to stand shoulder to shoulder. Yes, that's right. What's the significance? You see, shoulder to shoulder, standing shoulder to shoulder has many use advantages. Number one, God wants to create a sense of equality among the Muslims. They could be people with faith, with, with poor, you know, clothes and um, wrapped in rags who come to the mosque and a man with a refined taste and an eye for, for good clothing would stand next to him. He may feel a bit averse to touch him bodily and that is the pride which God wants to kill in you. And the message is, if you come to God, stand shoulder to shoulder with whoever is, is, uh, be, be, is, is next to you. So that sense of equality and sharing God's presence equally is emphasized in this. Secondly, Allah Ta'ala has spoken in Surah Sabah of a habit, of a demand of a people who wanted to distance themselves from each other. And God said it was a bad have a bad desire and they were punished ultimately and those areas were turned desolate. Now that also is a proof that some areas in the Middle East like the country of Saba were previously provided with God with lush green uh, foliage. This is exactly what is described in the Holy Quran. So what other proof does an enemy require? He says, then because they were ungrateful to God, they wanted longer distances, he said, we turned that area into desert. And then only the desert flora, flora uh, existed there, the, uh, and survived there in that area. So the message is, 
get closer to each other, be brotherly to each other, bridge the gaps and make one united community in the world. The same message is given in Surah Saf, where the Holy Quran says that they, the Muslims are like uh, a building made of uh, bricks closely packed in, in Saf. The full verse, please. In Allah, you will be in a Yukatilun of his civil suffering, can now Gunyanum versus those who fight in the cause of Allah in Saf in the lines as if. They were uh, buildings made of reinforced concrete. They joined together, be close together. That message is also given in that uh, advice that we should get closer. And again, if a place of worship is loosely packed, it will appear very disorderly. It doesn't look uh, beautiful at all. And small sp more space will be needed for smaller number. If they pack themselves loosely, you know, standing here legally and standing there, that will create not only a bad impression, but also you would require more space. So for uh, uh, the economy in space, it is a very useful order that whenever you go to mosque, fill the mosque to such a degree that the maximum number of Muslims can worship there. As far as the straightness of line is concerned, the Holy Prophet ﷺ said that if you do not be careful about the straightness of your lines, it might reflect on your hearts and your heart also, hearts also may become crooked. That is to say, the outward discipline sometimes is very essential. It also reflects on your attitudes. If you are not careful in your outward discipline, sometimes your inner attitudes also get distorted. Right? Thank you. The last question of tonight, the remaining names have been noted down and inshallah, they will be given the priority tomorrow. And after they have answered the, the, the asked their question, then we'll turn to others. You have noted down the names? No, sir. No, he has. Yes? Yes. They have been noted down, I've, I've been told. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My question is that uh, for the Russian press is not Holy Quran. Uh, we are instructed by Allah and the Holy Quran that we should say thousands before we recite any portion of the Quran. We should recite uh, thousands. Recite thousands, that's fine. Yes. And uh, before Surah Bismillah is part of the Surah and Surah. But when we are reading a portion of the Surah, uh, which does not mean that Bismillah is not ready, we can only recite how to rely on the No, no, uh, it is not that you can only recite. You must recite Tawwuz before reciting the Holy Quran from anywhere. But Bismillah is not prohibited before reciting any portion of the Holy Qur'an. Because it, it, is, uh, it is an advice from Allah to always start with Bismillah, whatever you do. You see? So yes. Bismillah applies to everything. And Tawuz applies to the Holy Qur'an alone. So if somebody says Bismillah, recites Bismillah, even when Bismillah is not mentioned in Surah Fatiha, he does it under another instruction and it is not forbidden. But some people are very strict in their attitude. There's, there's some Qaris particularly, when they recite a surah from the beginning, they say Auzubillah and then follow it by Bismillah like it is a custom everywhere. But when they begin the post recitation from the center or somewhere, somewhere else in the Holy Quran, they avoid saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
But in the Talawat, in Ahmadiyya community, the, the custom is that we also say Bismillah even if we recite a portion of the Holy Quran from the middle or somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. why we are not permitted to eat pork. On all these issues, I have spoken at length in depth repeatedly in so many question answer sessions. So it is better to have access to those cassettes which are available. Should be available here as well. Cassettes are available. So instead of my going, going on repeating answers to these, if you are interested, you can share those cassettes and uh, I think inshallah you will be able to satisfy the query from your non-Muslim friends. Right? Yes, please. From there? From there. Ah, well, first let me know what you want to ask from there. <laughs> <laughs> because from there I won't be able to understand it. That also I have repeatedly answered, but all right, you go and get it registered. Who gave birth to the 
solved. Second question is. Sir, you asked only one question when you came here. No, one. You only asked one question when Sir. you came here. And I generally understand what you are saying because you told me before leaving. The next I will not understand anyway. So, the, about the surrogate mother, the simple principle involved is this, that uh, Islam emphasizes the role of discipline in the process of birth. And that is the meaning of the institution of marriage. And the responsibilities are uh, very clear-cut in case of marriage. But when there is confusion regarding other participants in the process of birth, then the entire institution of a responsible system would be destroyed. And that is the reason why surrogate mother question has raised so many legal questions in the United States and it is still hotly, a hotly debated subject. I inquired about the role of the surrogate mother and uh, doctors, scientists who knew the subject well, they informed me that it is not just the ovum which supplies the character, but also throughout pregnancy, the uterus plays an important role in imparting certain characters to the embryo. So as such, the identity of the mother will become confused and the legal issues will always remain debated and that is against the principle of Islam which wants to lay clear-cut responsibilities so that there is no confusion about rights and obligations. Understand? The second question you have to come here and ask and then return to the microphone and ask the question from there. Because from there, the voice is so blurred that it doesn't reach, reach here clearly. Unless they set the, the loudspeaker right again, it will be difficult for me to understand questions from that microphone. Okay. Third question is, uh, because Muslims are allowed to have you know, more than one wife, so this confusion is not created. But uh, what about those Muslims who are living in countries where they are not allowed to have more than one wife? What no, they can. There is no such country, in my, to my knowledge, where they do not permit to have more than one wife. Legal wife, yes. But illegal wife, you can have hundreds. There is no problem. You see, a Muslim can take the posture that this woman, according to you, is not a wife. All right, call, it, call her a mistress. But in the sight of my God, she is a wife. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Yes? Will you teach me or the microphone after? Okay. Huh? Okay? All right. Me one? Forget the okay, but then it was. Huh? No, but there's two, three questions here at one, at one time. So they're repairing? They're repairing, actually. Ah, no. Share this microphone with me. Come here. Speak into it. We all Muslims know the importance of uh, black stone, Ajigal Sud. And my question is, it is simple stone. Why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave case or bosa to that stone? Do you never give bosa to any simple thing? Has a thing to be very complex for you to give bosa? Huh? Tell me your principle of your giving bosas first. <laughs> come on, come on. The affection and love we have, even we give bosa. Right. Affection and love. Yeah. But is that affection only for complex things, never for simple things? Apin, there is, is history. The of that affection? 
that, that may be uh, history as we get closer to uh, your ring. Because then there is a simple ring. Yeah, but we have Why? Uh, because it it belongs to the holy place. So this, this any stone belongs to the holy place where Allah is worship, and it happens to be the first stone which was used in the construction of the first house of God. Doesn't it, doesn't it become very precious and lovely? It is, but some people says that it is uh, brought from the Jannah. It's not asking that question, just ask this question. Yes. 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 Would you say any reason why that stone should be loved very specially? It should be, it should be, but... But, uh, but, uh, but both of you are not being <laughs> No, the Hindus say that uh, if we are worshipping cow or something like that, stone, statues, you two people give my both. Now the question has changed the form. He says, the new question is that Hindus say, because we, when we worship cows, you object, and yet you give bosa to the stone. How do they worship cows? Do they kiss the cow? When you kiss anybody, do you worship him? Kiss is not a sign of worship at all. It's a sign of love. And we never object against Hindus loving anybody, anything in the world. We love our horses, our cattle, uh, our little colts. We hug them, we, we kiss them. There's no, nothing wrong. There's no contradiction in Islam. Love is something else, worship is something else. Because we object to their worshipping God, not kissing God. We're kind of worshipping cows, not kissing cows. You understand? Thank you. Any other question, please? Yes, come on and let's try the microphone. Oh, there. Yes, it seems to be all right now. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Well, sir. My name is Shahab Fikshir. I'm from North of Jumat. One of my known and Muslim friends asked me this question. If the Promised Messiah is so dedicated and is so deep in love with the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad's Kiri, peace be upon him, why didn't the Promised Messiah perform much? When the Holy Prophet ﷺ was prevented forcibly from performing Hajj, he did not perform Hajj. That is what Surah Al-Fatah is all about. That is the history created on the field of uh, Hudabiya. Surah Hudabiya is related to that issue. So the, the uh, inference is, that whenever somebody is forcibly prevented from performing head, he must not perform much. Otherwise, he will be contradicting the conduct of Ahl So this was the situation vis-à-vis Hazrat Masih Maudalaslam. He was forcibly prevented because already at that time in Mecca and Medina, all over the Muslim world, edicts had been issued that he has forfeited his right to live. If ever he comes here, he will be killed. So when Ahadur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that situation abstained from performing Hajj, why should Masih have done the Hajj at the same time, in the same situation? Understand? Thank you. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. My question is... Uh, and your name is? Yes. My name is Sahih Ali, I'm from Scarborough, Jamaica. Right. I'm on the uh, social study group, the Islamic study group, that you right. have asked me to set up. And I just, there's one thing I was thinking about. I noticed here uh, about how when uh, when Nazareth, for instance, we see, that I see a lot of times that I'm not sure if it's a Pakistani culture or, or if there's a religious reason to it, but that um, many times the girl does not attend. And I'm wondering, is this a cultural practice or is it a Girls do not attend what? They don't know. And I'm wondering, is this a cultural thing that... No, they should... Who told you the girls don't attend their nikahs? They do, but they don't appear in, uh, with men. They sit with ladies. Okay. Ladies, uh, ladies, just... ladies come to the, that part of the mosque which is reserved for them so that they can freely worship God without being embarrassed by men's looks. 
So that is the purpose, to give them a free role to play. And the late, uh, Muslim, and many girls who are to be married, they also participate in that account. I understand, yes. I thought it was... Uh, no, 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 it's not yeah. true. Yes, that's, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, why is it that we can't see Asa prayers uh, second time? Like, if so I... Yes, yes, I understand. Why should you say the prayer second time anyway? No, like, Have you ever eaten second lunch a few minutes after that? No. Why don't you eat second lunch? Because, because we have eaten lunch. Mm. So when you have said a prayer, you have said a prayer, that's all right, that's enough. It's not a question of saying second asr. It's a question of saying nafal after you have said a prayer. Ahadur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed us to say the wafil at certain times, almost all the day long and night long, except on two particular occasions. After the morning prayer and before the sunset. After the asr prayer, uh, before the sunrise in the morning, after the Asa prayer and before the sunset. These are the two times when nature requires that we go out and indulge in sports and walks, etc. and enjoy ourselves a closer company with nature. So how beautiful is the teaching of Islam. God has forbidden us to over indulge in religious and in worship for the sake of artificially pleasing God, you deny yourself those pleasures which God has created for you. And because they are very special times, so Allah says, I don't want your worship here now. Please go ahead and enjoy yourself. So that is the message. No, what I mean is like, if I said my Zohra prayer uh, individually, and I go to the mosque, and some, there's a jamaat going on, I attend it. Right. But if I've said my asr prayers... If you have said your asr prayer individually, yeah. and there's a congregational asr prayer, you can join that asr prayer. The first will become nafal, and the second would be right one. Because congregational prayer has a superiority over the ordinary prayer. So the first prayer becomes insignificant as compared to the opportunities of your uh, joining a congregation. There is a different issue altogether. So that asr will not be a nafal. That will be the real asr. The first will be considered as a nafal. Okay? Any other question? Yes, please. No, no, just for just a moment. With one without cap first, then you'll turn. Asalaikum. My name is Yes. Front row to east. Uh, You're trying to what? Front row to east. Front row to east. Yes. Uh, will you bend further down? Go we'll get this right. Yes. Uh, so I have a business uh, which is we sell meat and then it's part of the sausage. And uh, like I am also this question how many times we have done from last four years in the business. Okay, we have the model that's all meat. And it's not how the baby says about. Okay, should we then uh, if you are not in business and then you'll be raped? I have no idea this I must say. No, you're not asking that. You're asking because I'm in business, so can I eat? And then all the Muslims come to me asking me what is this? Your being in business or not being in business is irrelevant to the question. The question is simply this. Can any Ahmadi Muslim, any Muslim for that matter, eat that meat which has been slaughtered for the sake of use by human beings, yet Bismillah, Allah Akbar has not been decided before it was slaughtered? That is the question? Okay. It is permit, permissible to eat that meat, provided you say Bismillah, Allah Akbar, before eating that meat. Provided it is slaughtered for the purpose of human consumption and it is not haram otherwise, then of course it is permissible. Okay, sir. Thank you. Part of the question is, sir, we sell the sausages and there is pork. You, do not, you, you are not permitted by Rasulullah to sell sausages. If you do that, you are defying his instructions. 
White cap and then the, the gray. Assalamualaikum. Dr. Mohamed Sahib. Uh, Assalamualaikum. My name Assalam. is Nasir Ahmed Khalid. Right. I'm from Pakistan. Right. Here from Scarborough, Jamal. Uh, Zul, I have a question regarding profit. Okay. Uh, we learn in Holy Quran that uh, and him has been put on profit. Particularly in the Indian countries, Middle East, probably even in India. But we can't see any profit route in this part, but uh, not uh, American and Australian uh, continents. Can you see profit route in India? Zurabot Wood have learned. Huh? We have learned about Buddh. No, but do they call Buddha a prophet? Tell me. What about Krishna? What about Rama? What about Burma? What about in, and uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Vietnam, and Korea and Japan and China and uh, all the South Pacific Islands? How many prophets did you hear came there? Then maybe may, may I uh, rather turn my question to this side? Why even those areas were left like that? All right, add Africa, please, to the list, <laughs> <laughs> and still another question. You see, the Holy Quran tells us a very different story from what you are trying to tell. The Holy Quran says, "Himmin ummatin illa khalafi hanazi." There is no people at no time to which God never God had not sent warners. And so also the Holy Quran speaks in different ways of the same subject, emphasizing that no part in the world was left was left unattended by God. Yet when we look at the general scenario of the whole world, you do not come across prophets. You come across uh, gods, demigods, sons of God, sisters of God, brothers of God, and this and that, and all nonsense. And one is wondering where the prophets have disappeared. The fact is that those people who are attributed, to whom Godhood is attributed, about whom their, belief, their followers claim now that they were gods or semi-gods, they were the prophets of Allah. They were raised beyond human status much later on. And the evidence of that is found in the prophethood, the line of prophethood in the Middle East to which you refer. Jesus Christ is a very fit example for that. He was a prophet of God, but you know the process how gradually he was elevated from the human status to that of a God. So this is the human nature that whenever a messenger of Allah comes with a message, they reject him very, very strongly and with, with great animosity. And they say, you are a prophet, you are less than a man, you are a madman, you are this and that. And when he passes away and when Allah gives his message the promised victory, then the same crooked people who first denied him, even the human status, begin to raise his status beyond humanity. So all these areas which you are talking about have had their share of prophethood. Now I have spoken to the Red Indians. I have met their leadership both from North America in Canada, United States and recently in South America and also in uh, Guatemala, Central America. And uh, you'll be surprised to learn that when you probe them deeper, you always find that they had some holy people who lived long ago, who delivered them a message, who saw good dreams, and they, it was 
their dreams which conveyed their messages and so on. I went to Australia, there I met with the leadership of the Aborigines. I investigated the same matter there and the same was the answer. They, they told me that still we have holy people who are told by God, they don't say God, the word they use is the ultimate path, the soul of things, the, you know, the ultimate in the creation. They, they try to describe a super, super being, but uh, they don't use the word God as we know in English or Allah as we know in Arabic, but obviously they are referring to the Creator. So they say He remains in contact with us through dreams and uh, we have holy men who interpret those dreams. So these are the messengers to Allah of different sorts. So prophethood is everywhere. Why is the prophethood, the line of prophethood in the Middle East so much emphasized? Why is the history there so clearly recorded? Why the history elsewhere was permitted to be obliterated gradually? The simple reason for that is that the tree of prophethood on which Ahadrat was to be born was historically extremely important. And the other trees and lines which had to gradually die out, they were unimportant because people from there were ultimately to join Islam and to follow other normal Rasulullah So it is like the tree of evolution. When you study in biology how evolution took place, right from the start of amoeba, they draw the line and trace the passage up to man. And those animals which become links in between, they are mentioned as important things. While there are hundreds of thousands of other species which are left uh, as unimportant, their name is not mentioned in that tree. So that is exactly the similar case. Because the evolution of religion was to culminate in the form of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu So from him back to the Adam, that line had to be traced and also had to be recorded. So that is the reason why you consider that prophets only came in the Middle East. Thank you very much, Hazrat. Thank you. Now, Dr. Sahib, please. How are you? Fine? Thank you, sir. I, I, I'm told that you're getting old at last. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, I thought it didn't apply to you. <laughs> because somebody told me that from big cars they have not fallen back to small cars. And you say what is what is there in, in speeds and uh, you know that sort of thing. So that gives me the message that you're getting old. Previously you wouldn't drive a car which uh, you could not drive beyond 100 miles an hour. Is that right? 105 miles, I have driven with you. <laughs> so what is happening to you now? Law of nature, at last, getting better of you? Yes, we are part of it. Yes, we are part of it. Yes. Now please. My name is Mohamed uh, Diva from... Uh, you still required to introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, come on, help yourself, yes? Uh, I have uh, two questions, one to be small, and that is uh, the word God and Allah. And we use the word God. Is this in reality is a misnomer because Allah a really translation, I just want to know whether really the word God is a real translation of Allah. No, no. Allah is intranslatable because it's a personal name. Allah. In no other religion that personal name is mentioned except in Islam. But previously, according to the Holy Quran, some other prophets of Israel were also told of this name. For instance, in the, in the case of Hazrat Suleiman, the Holy Quran records that when he sent a message to the Queen of Seba, he started, he began his message with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So that shows 
the name Allah, the person's name was also uh, shared by God with other prophets earlier. But universally, it was not known until Islam came. As far as the word God, you should uh, realize that English is born out of Persian language, mainly. Long, long ago, in the, from the Central Asia, people who spoke uh, an old version of Persian language migrated northwards and uh, reached the Scandinavian peninsula. From there, they penetrated downwards towards Europe, and uh, those Normans who occupied England, they brought the English language with them. With them. In old days, it was called Anglo-Saxon. So the word God is born out of the old Persian, which still retains its word exactly as uh, it was they, they were spoken earlier. Khuda is the word, and God is the distortion of the word Khuda. Khud and good. Khuda and God, they are the same words, in fact, and uh, the slight pronunciation and disorder of the one word Khuda has turned into God. Khuda also has a meaning, thing which comes of itself. There is no one who creates it. Khud a, you know that sort of thing. That is the meaning I have attributed to it. But the word Khuda, I believe nobody has mentioned this significance. Maybe I am wrong, but I love to translate it like this. So, I think it is Khuda, which has been uh, mispronounced and transferred to English language and has become God. You see, like daughter, for instance. Daughter is written D-A-U-G-H-T. It should be pronounced Dukhtar. And Dukhtar is the Persian word for daughter. And in old English, it was pronounced Dukhtar. Now we wonder why this stupid spelling, why add A, G, U, G, you know, G, H sound at all when it's not pronounced. But when you trace the history of pronunciation in English, you'll be surprised to find that Arabic Persian words were pronounced like Persian words in Old English, which is called Anglo-Saxon. And later on, gradually they changed further and further as they went uh, away from the source. So that is what I believe happened to the word Khuda. My next question is uh, regarding the homeopathy school of medicine. I, I know you are an adversary, but uh, <laughs> what is wrong with it? Tell me. <laughs> yes, sir, I was the adversary in the past time. The modern trend is in the West mainly in Europe and in Canada. Uh, I can't say about the United States. The trend is changing yes. towards the homeopathy medicine. Correct, you are the right. So you have, you have also reformed? <laughs> Not <laughs> very oh, all right. My few colleagues yes. who have practiced medicine for 20 years yes. they have gone to the homeopathy school all about the of the humanity right. right. and they did uh, six months advanced schools right. and they are going to practice in my area the whole humanity. Good. What I'm saying is a rule that I know that uh, we have been practicing home humanity for a long time. We right. must have a large number of cases. But my question was, is there a specific treatment in homeopathy towards the stress or the stress oriented uh, symptoms or symptoms? You see, there is no specific treatment as such, but there are so many medicines which are related to the stress and the stress related syndrome. And one has to go by the symptoms because, in according to homeopathy, it is not just uh, a disease after which we prescribe. It is a symptom complex after which we prescribe. A headache, for instance, 
to an allopathic doctor is headache and aspirin would be the first word which comes to one's mind or any other similar drug and the approach is to dull the senses so that the pain may remain there, the cause of pain may remain but the patient feels at ease despite the presence of the pain. Homeopathy does not treat pain as such. Homeopathy goes for the cure of the source of trouble. If the source of trouble is removed, then the pain will disappear. So that is why we, it, uh, 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 this headache becomes a headache for a homeopath. Because he has to find out what, what is, why this headache. And if he analyzes correctly, then the medicine which he gives works like magic. It does not remove only the sense of pain, but also removes the reason for that pain. Similarly, for every nervous disease, for every depression, there has to be some particular specific cause. So you can't treat the nervous depression with generalities. You have to analyze the symptoms of the patient and find out what possibly could be the cause. If you correctly analyze, then you prescribe him something. With the grace of Allah, then it works uh, miraculously. If, I, if you share the symptoms of the patients you have in mind, inshallah, I'll prescribe something for that. But also, I, I tell you that sometimes in certain situations of stresses, like social stresses all over and uh, general stresses, many a time one drug also works in so many patients. So it is possible for you to analyze the case of one patient, find a successful drug, drug and in similar situations start using it without much attention to detail. And in 50, 60, 70 percent, it is possible that that would work. So I can prescribe it, not here later on, when you send me the symptoms in detail, then I'll tell you what you should use. Thank you. Would you advise amateur physicians to explore more into the homeopathy? Very much, very much so. I deeply encourage, I direct them, I instruct them, I help them in diagnosis, and some of the MD doctors in England are very happy to report to me that many such patients which were not cured by them through allopathy, they were cured allopathically. And uh, the patients in England not only come from Amadis but from all over the society, British, people from other groups, foreigners of all sorts. And uh, sometimes some interesting things happen. Once I received a letter while I was traveling in, uh, tour, on the tour of America last time, I also came to Canada. I received a letter in America from a British uh, a specialist from Harley And he said that there was a patient of mine whom I considered incurable. When she next time visited me, she was absolutely all right. When I inquired from her what had happened, she gave me your address and said, you practice homeopathy and uh, you treat such patients. So would you permit me to refer to you other such patients? You see? So the evidence came not from my wishful thinking but from somebody who had no knowledge of homeopathy but who was an expert in his own field. So. Things are working and homeopathy is becoming very popular in England nowadays. Extremely popular. And uh, it's a matter of time when it will take over the allopathy. But not surgery, mind you. It's a completely different and independent branch. Surgery is not a rival of homeopathy. Allopathic medicine is a rival of homeopathy. And uh, as such, I advise MLE doctors to learn homeopathy if they can and enlarge the scope of their serving the cause of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, please.
after the bareheaded gentleman, I will turn to the blue cap. Okay? No, no, it's all right. It's not necessary to ask a question of the cap. <laughs> Mohammed Salim Zahir. Mohammed Kaleem Zahir, okay. Right. My question is, I have some Muslims uh, and friends asking a question about the marriage of uh, Christ. As I said, a prophet should not be married. Uh, a prophet should not be? Married. Married. Why not? Well, I know the Muslims and friends ask me. As they said, the Christ was not married. You see, if a prophet should not be married, then all who believe in him will become extinct. Because they will not marry either, and uh, their race will come to an end. So it's a good fabula to bring humankind to an end. <laughs> see? Why should the Christians follow Jesus Christ if that is the model? Is he a model or not a model? Ask them. Okay. Yeah, he said he if he is a model, then stop marrying and disappear. Hand over your country to those who come from other countries. <laughs> <laughs> Will they do that? Well, I don't know, ask them. All right. Good. Any other question? Yeah, another question is uh, why the Muslims are allowed to have four wives? Yeah. Why should a woman can have four husbands? <laughs> has, has your father? Married four times? No, no my. Your uncle? No, nobody in my family. Nobody in the family. So why do you say, oh, why are the Muslims called, told to marry four times? They're not. They're permitted in certain situations. They're not allowed to ask, well, what kind of situation they're permitted to get married? I have spoken on this subject at length for hours in different uh, question and answer sessions. Altogether, I've spoken for hours. So instead of my repeating everything, you should have access to those cassettes. You know, I am noticing this, that the Ahmadis in general, in most countries, do not know that they have answers available to them in their own country, lying in their mission houses. So what is the fun of sending these cassettes and having them recorded in all the mission houses of the world if the Ahmadis do not even know that they exist? And if you knew, you, the moment the question was raised in your mind, you could have contacted the mission and said, I want a, a cassette on this subject, and they will provide you. Right? Thank you. Yes, don't run away with the cap, please. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, right. Uh, yesterday I asked you a question about uh, how would the idea to go to Paris. And uh, how would you say that? Yes, yes. I'm satisfied. Please tell me. Uh, she left. Your wife requires more explanation. Yes. Where is she here? Uh, also. Ah, she was asking that uh, if we shouldn't be so careful with the dog, then why um uh, some of them at least had the there was a dog in the house and uh, the angels I understand that I have men I have spoken on this many a time. The fact is how does she know or anybody else knows what he meant by a dog? Because the many Muslim scholars have mentioned the similarity of the word qalb with qalb. And the Sufis particularly have spoken volumes on this similarity and they say human heart can turn into a qalb, not qalb, which means a dog. So if he turns towards the, to, towards the earthly things, then instead of a human being, he is closer to being a dog. And the Holy Quran has also spoken of this subject. A man who turns to the earthly things is uh, 
It is similar to that of a dog. Masalu ka masalil kal. So when the Holy Quran is speaking of that uh, in parable, why should we not understand that Mother Rasulullah was also commenting on the same verse? And he was also speaking in parables. So if there are people who are materialistic, who are avaricious, who are uh, ridden by their own passions, if such a man lives in a house, no gentleman would visit that house. So angels are also referred to as good human beings. So that kalb, kaf lam be, has been mentioned in the Holy Quran in application to the human behavior. So I believe, in the first instance, that tradition could have a relation to that verse of the Holy Quran and that is what he meant. Secondly, the type of dogs which were kept in those days in Arabia and also in our countries are generally for uh, defensive purpose, for protection. And they were kept loose. And if such a dog who is vicious, who is fear, one who is fearful of, 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 the, of such a dog, is found in any house, gentlemen generally don't visit such houses. They are afraid of being bitten or being embarrassed by being chased by a dog. Nobody likes that. So maybe that is what he referred to. But it is impossible to believe. I, I totally reject that meaning. And I don't think it can be attributed wisely to the Sadis that if there is a dog somewhere, angels do not come there. What do the dog do to the angels? Why are they afraid of them? Absolutely nothing wrong. If there is a dog, dog kept, for instance, in a Muslim house for the purpose of uh, game, if the dog is used for catching birds and things, or uh, rabbits, is it not permissible in the Holy Quran? It is permissible. Holy Quran mentions it, that when you go out for game with the help of dogs, you say Bismillah before releasing them, and whatever they kill, even if you can't slaughter it, that becomes permissible for you. So where will that dog, these dog, dogs be kept? If they are kept in their own homes, like in the older culture, they did not have different house kennels for dogs. The dogs were kept in their own houses. So how could Islam permit you to keep dogs and then tell you, all right, you keep the dogs, we have permitted, but the angels won't visit you. It's, it's not reasonable. So either that tradition has to be interpreted metaphorically in the light of the Holy Quran, where dogs are specifically mentioned in relation to some crooked human beings. And the, we understand from that that Rasulullah was referring to that type of dog. Or the meaning should be uh, that if they are violent dogs, if they are dangerous dogs in houses, other gentlemen will not visit you. And I have noticed this in our own family, some people have dogs, some brothers or cousins, let's say, have dogs, sometimes they're loose, and it becomes very embarrassing when you enter the house and they start attacking you. So one avoids that, and uh, sometimes one tells them that unless you keep them on leash and tight, we will not visit you. Not as a protest, but because this is not possible. So maybe that is what he meant. Next time you go to your wife, ask her if she is still satisfied or not. Okay. If you not, tell me the, the question tomorrow then. Thank yes. you. Sir. I have one more question. Yes, From your, yourself? Yes. Okay. <laughs> As would, uh, we believe that uh, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, after uh, he left from uh, after 32 years, after the incident, he went to word and he spent a long time there. Right. 
what kind of contribution do you see for religion uh, on their part of life? Incidentally, let me tell you also that the Holy Quran speaks of dogs serving a very good purpose, living with the holiest of people in that age. And they are the, I'm speaking to the dogs of the people of the cave. Those were the only people who were visited by angels. So why should angels change their habit? While previously they could cope with dogs all right, why should suddenly they become so allergic to dogs? You know, the Holy Quran mentions, and there was, their dog was always there, you know, sitting like in the poster of a dog. And yet, according to the Holy Quran, they were the holiest people, godly people. So, any meaning of hadith which is contradictory to the Quran is bound to be wrong. This is the first principle. Because Ahadur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself could not contradict the Holy Quran. Now come to the second question, please. Uh, can I say something as well, in yes. regard to the dogs? Um, well, indeed... What to leave the dog alone? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they are serving, actually they are serving a very good purpose, like they have dogs for search and rescue, like... Uh, yes, I know. Uh, and for blind people and looking for drugs and so many other things they do. And those so are in case of those dogs, we know certainly that evil people don't visit the places where those dogs are kept. <laughs> but not the angels, eh? So come on, let's leave the dog alone for a while, please. Okay. Second question, what was it? Uh, Azul, Jesus, uh, peace yes. upon him. His, his, his visit to India and what uh, memories or impressions he left on the society there. Now, I have been exploring that because if Jesus lived there, there has to be some historical evidence of his presence. We quote that historical ev evidence with regards to his entry into Kashmir when Raja Shalbahan who was his contemporary witness or who saw him entering a valley, approached him, asked him questions. All that is recorded in Hindu annals. But what about Christianity? What happened to it? If they were all Israelites or mostly Israelites, they should have accepted his faith and there should have been a very strong mark of Christianity uh, visible in that area. Yet, it is not found there. So, what is the solution to this enigma? When you study Buddhism, then you discover what happened there. 500 years before Jesus Christ, Buddha appeared in that area. And before his death, he predicted that after me, there would come another Buddha, about 500 years after me. And he will be a foreigner Buddha. So, we believe that because that area was almost entirely Buddhist, when Jesus came there, he was accepted as a Buddha, according to the prophecies. And the title of a different place can be given to a prophet of a different place like uh, the title of Messiah belongs to Mediterranean, Middle Eastern area. But when Hazrat Musim Adalastat was appointed by God as the reformer of the latter days, he was also given that title. Now he is known largely by Masihim which is not a local title. So the titles can change. And when you further study the similarities between Christianity and Buddhism, you'll be surprised that their teachings are very similar and also the story of virgin birth has got penetrated into Buddhist literature. And the story is exactly similar to that, that of Christ, Christ's birth. So from study of the Buddha, old Buddhist literature, you can uh, get more and more evidence 
of the confusion and merger between the Christian between Christianity and Buddhism. So that is what was left behind. Another thing is that Christianity as known to the world today is not the Christianity which was preached by Jesus Christ as we believe. If we had genuinely preached Trinity and if we had literally claimed to be the Son of God, then everybody had a right to demand that show us when he went to Kashmir, whether he did preach Trinity or not, or did he, or he claimed to be the Son of God literally or not. We deny that. We say he never said it in the first instance. So the Jesus known to Kashmir was a monotheist, a believer in God. And uh, there was no shadow of Trinity which followed him there. It was created much later in St. Paul's age. So that is why the, similar, the, the same type of uh, Trinity or uh, the concept of sonhood is absent from the Christianity in Kashmir. Another evidence of Jesus' Jesus's visit to Kashmir and his message of uh, uh, unity of God has come out from uh, Afghanistan. And when you relate these things, then you begin to understand what might have happened. There was uh, a scholar from University of Oxford who was sent uh, for his thesis to visit Afghanistan and to study the old Sufi tribes there. And uh, he was particularly interested in the Sufi tribes of Herat. And he has published a book after returning the journey, from journey, completing his research. He published this book, uh, Among the Dervishes, is the title, published from, by Oxford University Press. Among the Dervishes, remember it, it should be available from England if you're interested. There, deviating from the subject of research, he tells a very intriguing story. He says, during my research of the dervishes in Herat, I came upon a tribe which called itself Christian Muslims. And uh, he said, I was flabbergasted. What do they mean by Christian Muslims? Either they should be Muslims or Christians. And uh, the, the name of that tribe is Musai. The head of the tribe was Abba Yahya. So according to him, he met Abba Yahya to find out the mystery of their being called Christian Muslims. So according to him, Abba Yahya told him that when Jesus was delivered from cross alive, you are totally mistaken that you succeeded in killing him on cross. He was delivered, he slightly migrated from that area and while on way to Kashmir, he stopped here and preached to us because we were also Israelites. And having done that, the, he left a message and a scripture which we still have in the form of scrolls. And this, uh, in, uh, this researcher writes that he, has seen, he saw that scroll and the claim of Abba Yahya was that he never preached Trinity, he never preached uh, the sonhood concept and he believed in one God and he believed in himself to be a messenger of God. What? All right. As such, excuse me, your attention is drawn somewhere else. Should I stop? But, but when you ask me a question, please attend to the answer. Yes. So, Abba Yahya explained to him that on way to Kashmir, this is exactly what he said. On way to Kashmir, Jesus Christ passed through us, delivered his message, and then once again returned to instruct us. And he said, we call him Jesus of Nazareth, and of Kashmir. 
He said, why Jesus of Nazareth in Kashmir? He said, because Jesus was born in Nazareth and died in Kashmir. Now this evidence is, has been unearthed from Afghanistan, from province, uh, Herat province, by a person, by an English researcher who had no idea about Ahmadiyya. He was a Christian scholar, went there to make research for another purpose. Incidentally, he came upon this, and he recorded this incident in his book entitled Among the Dervishes. Anybody can see that book, so that positively proves that when Jesus went to the east and traveled up to Kashmir, the message he carried was that of unity. And as such, the people, when they accepted Islam, they got completely merged, first Buddhism, then Islam, then they were completely merged with new messages and uh, all traces of that were wiped out except for the existence and the presence of Jesus in that part of the world. Right? Yes. Another question? Uh, just uh, one more thing as well. Yes, please. Did Jesus uh, ever made any attempt or uh, tried to reach uh, the people he left in the Middle East? Try to do what? To uh, contact those uh, people he left in the Middle East. His followers. You see, the researchers are now trying to find out what St. Paul meant when he said he saw Jesus many times and he delivered other, other messages to him and instructed him. Some believe that uh, because Jesus was alive when he was taken down from the, the cross, because he migrated to those parts of the world where the lost tribe of Israel had earlier migrated. So during the delivery of his ministry, he came upon St. Paul. And when he said he saw him, Actually, he saw Jesus Christ himself and uh, he came into repeated contact with him. That is conjecture. But this scholar which I have mentioned tells us that he once returned from Kashmir up to Herat and to look after their creed and, and inquire about their faith and character. So if he did, went, came back that far, he might have ventured even further, but that is again a conjecture. But up to Herat, we know there is evidence that he returned once again and inquired about their well-being and their faith, etc. Thank you, sir. You are welcome. Yes. Now, I have been reminding by Hasan, Hasan San Sahib that it is also attributed to Abba Yahya that he claimed that he is the direct 60th descendant of Jesus Christ in office perhaps. Ah, but the, that is doubtful, I should say. Ah, but, but you should not accept everything. You should also sift the material logically. Probably Maybe he might have claimed to be uh, the office holder the, of the sixth, sixth generation. He's married and therefore on the day he's married and he are in the higher than 16th, a lenient 16th. But again I should uh, yes. accept it with a pinch of salt, not without it. Too.